The, the markets are just completely uh, oblivious to the reality of, of what's going to happen. They just think that we could go back to sub 2% inflation. It, it, it's impossible. In today's video, Peter Schiff, founder, CEO and global strategist of Euro Pacific Capital, gives a warning that the 2008 crisis was just the prelude to a larger sovereign debt crisis in the United States that may lead to a collapse of the U.S. dollar. Will, will Jay Powell be in a position where he has to resign? Well, I don't know. I mean, if he's going to resign or not, I mean, who are they going to replace him with? Um, but, you know, the thing I, you know, Jay Powell is that, you know, he refuses to <clears throat> criticize the government for the deficit spending, which is absolutely his job. That's exactly what he's supposed to do. He claims that, well, it's, you know, it's we're independent. Um, it's the government that's supposed to stay out of the Fed, not the other way around. <clears throat> if the Fed is independent specifically so it can criticize the government when it does something wrong, when the government is pursuing excessive uh, mon uh, fiscal policy, it's up to the Fed chairman to uh, to call him out on it. That's exactly what Paul Volcker did. I mean, um, uh, Powell likes to talk about Volcker. Volcker was a, a staunch critic of the deficit spending during the, the 1970s, and he called on Congress to not only just cut spending, but he specifically said, you got to cut defense spending, you got to cut Social Security, you got to cut Medicare, you got to reduce these deficits because they're, they're, they're creating inflation, they're undermining economic growth. But Powell uh, refuses to criticize any of these deficits and just says that it's none of the Fed's business and the Fed is just going to take whatever fiscal policy is presented to it. Well, it can't do that. I mean, if it wants to fight inflation, it can't do it unless it's willing to bankrupt the government and just say, okay, well, you're going to run these deficits. We're not going to finance them. But of course, he's not going to do that. He's going to he's going to do whatever he has to do to finance those deficits. He's not going to allow a default. Uh, he, you know, so I don't know if he ultimately has to resign uh, so that he, he can get out of Dodge. But you know, the, 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 the markets are just completely uh, oblivious to the reality of, of what's going to happen. They just think that we could go back to sub 2% inflation. It, it, it's impossible. You know, the only reason that we had it for as long as we did had to do with all the lags. Uh, but we we created all this inflation and now the chickens are coming home to roost and they're just getting started. And, and, and as we have to ramp up the printing presses again, all they're doing is is throwing gasoline on the fire. But the fire hasn't gone out. It's still burning. Uh, what what yeah. assumptions do you think the markets are making right now? They're just looking at the time period prior to COVID, you know, and particularly from the 2008 financial crisis through COVID. And they're just assuming that that's normal and we're just going to go back to that. And they're wrong. I mean, that wasn't normal at all. That was an aberration. Uh, and, and a lot of it was driven by foreign central bank buying of dollars, particularly early on 2011, 2012. You had the currency war, you had all kinds of emerging market banks that were buying up uh, treasuries and U.S. dollars. The opposite is happening now. There's a move to de-dollarize. A lot of the biggest buyers of dollars are our sellers. They don't want U.S. treasuries anymore. They don't want our mortgage-backed securities. Uh, so we don't have the ability to keep exporting our inflation the way we did it uh, back at that time period. Plus, we're just catching up to all that inflation because initially a lot of the inflation as it worked its way into the real economy, went through financial assets. It went into the stock market, into the bond market. Uh, and, and, and now that inflation has already migrated into the real economy. It's in, it's in consumer goods, it's in services, and it's, it's there to stay. It's just taking hold and it's gonna build on this momentum. So we're gonna have very, very high inflation for many, many years. And, you know, the government can lie about it and, and try to hide it beneath these rigged CPI numbers, but it's now so, so bad. It's just that the markets haven't come to terms with that yet. Just like they initially thought inflation was transitory, then they thought, okay, it's not transitory, but the Fed can easily put this genie back in the bottle. They're going to find out that that expression is here for a reason. 
You know, they, they said, don't let the inflation genie out of the bottle. Why? Because it's very hard to put it back in. And, and, and the Fed made the mistake of letting it out of the bottle because they were too afraid of what might happen to the economy if they tried to keep it contained in the bottle. But now that it's on the loose, it is there's no way. And in fact, even Powell just last week in his speech acknowledged that inflation is probably not going to go back to 2% until sometime in 2025. But of course, he's wrong again. I mean, it's not going to be anywhere near 2% in 2025. I left Vienna this morning and uh, in my hotel where all the OPEC ministers are having a meeting today and their their uh, their headquarters is like a couple of blocks away. So they all stayed in the same hotel. And I saw all those guys. They they seemed like they were serious <laughs> when, when they were when they were meeting and getting, you know, they had they had security guards and police there with them. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we're going to see a, a move up in commodities. And especially if we get a leg down in the dollar, the dollar has been kind of holding steady. But if it breaks uh, based on all the weak economic data, and the anticipation of a of a softer Fed. And you know, when you mention these job uh, statistics, one of the things about the jobs numbers that nobody seems to really pay attention to is that one of the main reasons that so many jobs have been created over the past year is because so many people who already have jobs need second and third jobs to get by. And so it's inflation that is driving these jobs but it's not because the the labor market is strong it's because the labor market is weak and somebody can no longer support themselves on one job and so they need multiple jobs and if you look at the statistics we have a record number of people working multiple jobs some of them are multiple full-time jobs uh, but also what i think a lot of people are doing and it's getting into these numbers is there are people who are working from home and they're taking three or four or five jobs, you know, and they're not even doing them, but it takes a long time for them to get fired before their their employers figure out that they're not working. But there's a lot of these jobs that are being created uh, because of, of, of those dynamics. And, and a lot of the jobs that are being created, these part-time jobs, second and third jobs, they don't pay very much. You know, that's why people need three jobs. They lose one good job and they replace it with three l lousy jobs, that's a win for the statistics because that's two more jobs. Just talking about where the next uh, you know, deficit is going to be, because when we go to a, you know, a, a situation where we get 10% unemployment again and we get a big economic contraction, you're talking about maybe four to five trillion dollar deficits. I mean, because e every cycle, the deficits get bigger and bigger and the QE required to finance them gets bigger and bigger. And I don't think we can go for another cycle. The numbers are now too big, that there's no way we can goose the economy with that much drugs and not overdose at this point. Uh, you know, and to start having the, the, the deficits grow at, at, at that type of rate. And then the markets would have to realize that, wait a minute, the balance sheet is going to grow forever. It's all this talk about reducing the balance sheet and that you're not monetizing the debt and that America isn't a banana republic is just is just a fantasy because the debts can the deficits or the, the balance sheet can never be contracted because they can never get far along in the process without another recession kicking in. And now they have to ramp it up and it has to get much bigger than it was uh, than the prior peak. And so it's just always going up. It can never go down. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually the, the bottom has to drop out of the dollar. And that's when we have a real crisis in the country, because then once the dollar starts to spiral and it pushes up interest rates, long term interest rates, and now the Fed is forced to print more money to, to stop rates from rising, then it just accelerates the, 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 the process of getting rid of the dollar. And then you get into a into a currency crisis which is much worse than just a financial crisis. You know, I don't I don't own a, you know, I don't manage a closed end fund, but I'll ca call your attention. Maybe you should take a look at it, but so can, uh, you know, some of uh, the viewers here. But so I, I managed an open-ended mutual fund, the Euro Pacific bond fund. And um, for the reasons that you're stating, and so my bond fund is the number one bond fund in its category this year. I think there's about 200 funds in our category. Uh, we're up about, maybe six or seven percent year to date whereas the category is up one percent i mean we're crushing it 
Uh, and the reason that the fund is doing so well, and we're now, we're also uh, a five stars now over the last uh, three and five years. We're not quite number one over three and five years yet, but I think by the end of this year, we'll be number one uh, going back five years. But this year, we're just so far ahead of everybody because of the type of debt that we own, the emerging market currencies and our short durations. But yeah, I mean, if you're going to be in bonds, I mean, the Europe Pacific bond fund is is, is the place to be. I mean, we're still pro, uh, pretty small. I mean, you know, we're not on anybody's radar. I'm surprised, uh, you know, by because last year, my dividend payer fund was the number one fund in its category of 350 funds just because of our sector allocation and stock picking. But I mean, it didn't you know, necessarily result in, in that many flows. I mean, people don't even notice how far we're beating uh, our benchmarks and our categories because they still don't get it. But I think this is just an early indication of what's going to be happening because I was underperforming for many years until the last few years when I really caught up and then just you know took off based on uh, you know the forward thinking we were looking forward to uh, what's happening now years ago when it, what other people weren't even considering the possibilities. But it, it's going to get a lot worse, which means I think these funds that, that I'm managing are going to do a lot better. So you might want to take a look. You can't get a discount because it's an open ended fund. Um, but that, but that you don't have to worry about it, the discount getting bigger. You can always get out at NAV. Uh, so it's a good place uh, to park money if you don't want equity exposure, if you just want to be in uh in 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 cash but but get yield